people are starting to stream in, um, but I am going to uh, kick things off. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. This is uh, this is the 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 last before a summer recess um, for our uh, audiences not in Europe. Uh, you won't realize, but uh, it, in August in Europe, um, we we can't we can't host these things because we we all go on holidays. Um, so Amy, you know. That's that's one of the joys of working. If you came to this side of the pond, you know more holidays. Um, but you know, it's it's it's. I'm I'm super excited about today as well because um, uh, I have plans over the year to do a few of these. But you know, we we often have had we've had people like Alan Blinder, who clearly is like the the in in many ways, at least I think of him as the sort of founding father of the the literature on central bank communication and thinking about these issues, but. You know what's really exciting about this literature is we have a huge, a huge, huge number of uh, like younger scholars, and so Michael Ehrman is here as well, and and, and he he won't mind me saying he was he was an early uh, uh, researcher in the area at a time when I guess even when I started doing it, which was after him, you know it was hard to convince people that this was an interesting or exciting area to think about. Um, maybe we've just been lucky because central banks hit the zero lower bound, forward guidance, more speeches, more interest. But what's amazing is every year now on the job market, you see some really amazing papers and you know, some really you know, amazing young scholars who are working on it. And today we're going to see two of those. So, so um, I'm going to introduce them jointly. And actually what Amy's going to pre present is actually joint work for them, but, th but they are separately on different screens today, though sometimes they appear on the same screen when they're working together. Uh, so um, I, we're going to start with Amy Handlin, who's going to present some work. Uh, Amy is an assistant professor at Brown University, um, and so it's morning for her. And then, and then uh, Laura Gatti, who is at the ECB, will present after afterwards. I've given each of the papers a total of thirty-five minutes, uh, and so we'll we'll be looking at twenty to twenty-five minutes plus, you know, then the residual. Uh, for questions. If you have questions in the audience, please um, put them into the Q&A. It's the easiest place for me to handle them and, and, and to mark them. Uh, I will occasionally try and interject. So Amy, Laura, don't feel like you have to read them as you go. I will try and interject if there are natural breaks and if not, we'll handle them in the Q&A. Does that sound okay? If that's, if everyone's happy, so let's kick off. Amy, I hand, hand the floor over to you and I will let you know when you have a couple of minutes left. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much to, to Michael and Michael for inviting us to share our work. Uh, as Michael said, I'm going to be sharing some joint work that Laura and I have been working on. Uh, and so accordingly, the standard disclaimer applies. The title of our project is Systematic Monetary Communication Rules. Uh, we think that this is a very appropriate project for the central bank communication uh, seminar. Uh, so I'm really excited to get uh, your all feedback. So the first thing I want to start off with is this graph showing in the solid black line the target federal funds rate uh, in the U.S. Uh, from May 1999 through May two, uh, 2022, uh, when the FOMC has been regular, regularly releasing monetary policy statements after their policy meetings. In the gray dashed line is the FOMC statement word count, uh, which is actually showing the, the point that, that Michael just made, that once we hit the zero lower bound, we started to see an increase uh, in the length of FOMC statements, uh, seeming that the Fed was trying to use, you know, when they were unable to change their more traditional policy instrument, uh, they were trying to use communication or their words to try and influence uh, the economy. And so when we think about studying monetary economics, you know, historically, we've always thought about interest rates as being uh, a main monetary policy tool that's determined by some systematic uh, systematic policy rule. And, uh, you know, realistically, you know, it'll be there's a systematic component and a shock component, uh, but there's some rule that we can think about macro fundamentals mapping into the policy decisions into the interest rate. As new monetary policy tools have been increasing in popularity, uh, there's been uh, research coming out studying the systematic representations or rules for those different dimensions of policy. And in this paper, we're going to think about communication as one such tool. So in this paper, what we do is we conceptualize and we estimate monetary communication rules in the United States. And when we think about conceptualization, uh, we're thinking about 
an announcement or a monetary policy announcement as a filter. So this figure is kind of showing what we're imagining, where the Fed has expectations about macro fundamentals, about how it wants to make policy, and then it chooses the words it wants to release in its monetary policy announcement. And we see this arrow one is representing the communication rule, uh, this mapping between Fed expectations into words. Then markets read that announcement and then they try to back out or uh, uncover information about what the Fed thinks is happening in the economy uh, or what the Fed is going to do in terms of policy. So uh, this second arrow is what we're going to be calling a perceived communication rule, where you know, the market is trying to, to back out uh, these initial expectations. In the paper, we talk about, uh, or we provide more theoretical motivation for when this style of, or this way of representing communication matters, or when communication rules are going to have an effect on market expectations. Uh, the, the bottom line from that is that as long as there's imperfect information about policy and the economy and how the Fed communicates, there's gonna be a role for communication to affect expectations um, uh, of markets. And what we're going to talk about today for most for the for the presentation is we're going to really focus on the estimation part, where we use uh, regularized regressions to predict macro variables that represent the Fed forecasts, as well as market expectations from the text of FOMC announcements themselves. We're going to have uh, different uh, communication, we're going to call these different communication rules, uh, and we're going to have different ones for the different macroeconomic variables. Additionally, we're gonna have some different rule types where first we're going to look at what if we assume communication rules. So this mapping from expectations to words is fixed over time, over our entire sample period. Then we're gonna relax that assumption and look at what happens if we allow it to be time varying. Uh, and then finally, we're gonna look at uh, how do markets perceive the text? What are the things that markets are paying closest attention to? And as a preview of our findings that we'll go over um, in the presentation today, uh, first, uh, you know, after we estimate our many reduced form communication rules across the different exercises, uh, these are the three main results. Uh, first, we find that the Fed does not seem to systematically communicate about short run inflation expectations. Uh, this is something that we were really surprised about given you know, the dual mandate in the US, but uh, we find that the Fed focuses more on conveying short run real side uh, uh, expectations and forecasts uh, or policy decisions and forward guidance. Our second result is that after 2008, during the zero lower bound period, we find that the FOMC was signaling liftoff well before the actual increase in the federal funds rate. Uh, this is something that is largely di driven by the FOMC statements, including discussions about improvements to the economy or hinting with forward guidance that eventually liftoff is coming. Uh, and we can systematically uh, and empirically pick up on, on that language. The third thing that we find is that there is a difference between what markets perceive communication to mean and what the Fed is intending communication uh, in the announcements to actually represent. And remember, so this is basically saying that the market has a different understanding of how the FOMC communicates from what the FOMC thinks. We also find that these gaps or these differences are bigger when there's more uncertainty uh, over policy and the economy. So by the end of the talk, we'll, we'll just we'll, we'll explain all of these results in more detail, uh, but this is the preview uh, at this point. For the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the literature. Uh, I just want to you know, highlight that we're really focusing on uh, engaging with the text analysis of central bank communication literature uh, and trying to think about rather than you know, shocks or thinking about shocks or thinking about um, trying to predict categorical variables, we're going to be predicting continuous variables from the FOMC statement text uh, and having this connection of, you know, thinking about systematic communication um, uh, as a policy tool. So the rest of the talk is going to proceed as follows. Uh, first, I'm going to start with the empirical framework that's going to, uh, and then we'll go into the different types of rules that we're going to be estimating. For all so, the, Amy, Amy, just yeah. just because it's a it's a natural breaking point, I'm going to park. Uh, Paolo uh, has asked a question, which I think is going to probably come up, or you can deal with at the end, which is about why the Fed doesn't simply announce the rule for future interest rates. Um, yeah. I have so, my own answer to that, but I'm going to leave it for you. <laughs> so, so I'm going to say I'm actually going to table that discussion and say that um, 
even when there is an announcement of the future path of rates or a forecast, there's still room for interpretation and miscommunication. Um, and so that's going to be here in section five, and we're going to come to that. We're going to specifically look at the uh, summary of economic projections, so the SEP dot plots, uh, and compare them with market forecasts for what the federal funds is going to be over the future. And here we still find some interesting differences in which language is seen as most predictive or important for uh, influencing expectations. Uh, so, so, so we'll get to that, uh, but that's an excellent point. Okay, I don't see any other questions in the Q&A, so I'm gonna keep going uh, for the sake of time. Uh, so this is the main regression specification that we're gonna be working with. Uh, we're gonna be working with ridge regressions because uh, you know, this is one really common way to try and uh, work with text as an input variable uh, to different regressions to uh, try and uh, account for potential overfitting. Uh, and what we're going to be looking at is this main specification here, where our output variable is going to be a macro variable for a particular meeting. Um, when this is the Fed forecast, this is kind of an, uh, an approximation or an estimation of the inverse of the communication rule. So we're having the text on the right-hand side and the macroeconomic forecast uh, on the left-hand side. Uh, but then for the perceived communication rule, we're going to have the federal funds futures uh, implied expectations on the left-hand side and then text uh, on the right-hand side. The uh, coefficients we're gonna be estimating are going to be different for each output variable we're going to look at. Uh, and additionally, we're going to have a different uh, regularization parameter for, for each of the different output variables we're looking at. So just quickly to talk about which output variables we have in the paper, uh, we're gonna focus on subsets of these uh, for the talk today. Uh, we look at things like the actual target federal funds rate that's announced or changes in the target federal funds rate to see how that co-varies with the language that's also uh, released on that same day. Uh, we look at the green book and teal book forecast for next quarter output growth, unemployment and inflation. Uh, we're going to also be looking at forecasts for what the federal funds rate will be at the end of the year from those dot plots from the SEP. Uh, and then we're going to have a matched version of that uh, for market forecast of what the federal funds rate will be at the end of the year using Fed fund futures prices. Uh, for these different data sets, we're working with different time ranges uh, just based on data availability. For the uh, way we're thinking about text, so this is something that I just want to clarify and we'll see some examples of it. Uh, what we're looking at in terms of representing an FOMC statement is going to be a vector of weighted frequencies of quad grams. Um, and we're going to index those by J, and there's going to be different quadgram frequencies uh, for every statement. Uh, quadgrams are just the extension of bigrams or trigrams to having four words in a row. Um, so these, the reason why we're looking at sequences of four words in a row is because it gives us a little bit more sense of context, um, even though there's still a sense of bag of words uh, here where the fact that one quadram occurs before another quadram doesn't matter in the specification, uh, but having these four word units still allows us to capture some uh, measures of, uh, of context that we'll show in the next couple of slides. We also use TFIDF weighting, which is gonna down, down weight words that occur in every single announcement um, because those are gonna be seen as not being important in determining differences in variation from one statement to the next. Uh, we also do other cleaning uh, that's pretty standard in, in text analysis, uh, but for the sake of time, uh, I'm not going to go into those. Uh, but just to sum up, the main uh, results that I'm going to be showing you are going to be uh, two different types. First is going to be predicted y hats from the text, the estimated coefficients and the text of actual statements for given meetings. The second type of result that we're going to look at is a list of the, the, the quad grams that are associated uh, or that are, that are the most predictive of a particular output variable. So these will have the largest coefficients, either most positive or most negative coefficients. And uh, with that general framework, we're gonna be going into looking at the results and what we can show um, with this approach of uh, this, you know, this really reduced form approach of looking at uh, these communication rules. So with the fixed communication rule, first I'm gonna show uh, the communication rule that we have for changes to the target federal funds rate, the realized changes uh, to the target federal funds rate uh, over our entire sample period. And we estimate the fixed communication rule as being that regression 
uh, run over our entire sample. So this is say, assuming that the mapping from uh, the change in the target federal funds rates to the words that they choose is, is constant over time. And what we can see here is that this matches fairly closely. Um, we see that the uh, estimated model can you know, largely predict when there's you know, increases versus decreases to the target federal funds rate. Uh, just to give a, a sense of, okay, well, this is just a predicted line. What are the words that are actually driving this? Uh, here's a list of the top 15 words in the paper. We, we have top 20 words for all of our different communication rules. Uh, but for this, uh, for what could fit on the slide, I can only get to 15. Uh, so these are the words in the left column that have the most, the large, the top 15 largest uh, positive coefficients in the regression to predict changes to the target federal funds rate. And uh, on the right column is are the coefficients associated with decreases uh, to the target federal funds rate. And one thing that's really, you know, just to highlight a couple of these, um, you know, at least one thing that Laura and I are very excited about is, you know, the quadrams that are picked up are ones that, you know, intuitively make sense to a human reader as well. So for example, this first one is saying if there's, you know, the quadram that says there's a gradual increase to the funds rate, um, that's seen as being predictive of an increase to the target federal funds rate. Uh, if we go down a little bit further, we can see some intuition from you know, Keynesian models where there's discussions um, about like inflation. Uh, we have uh, accommodation to take a balanced approach. Um, we also, um, or the balanced approach part is saying that like removing accommodation, uh, then beginning to remove policy accommodation as being another thing that, that we were really excited about. On the right-hand side for decrease of the target federal funds rate, uh, we see things about trying to uh, support employment. Uh, we see uh, discussions about uh, the debt holdings of the, uh, of the central bank. Um, and then we also see it, you know, uh, thinking about more policy accommodation as well. Um, and, and so this is something that we were pretty excited about that the, the, the quadrams that we're showing up are things that, you know, are one about monetary policy uh, and seem to make sense uh, in, in their context. So, can I ask a clarification question here? Yes. On, on the timing. So if I recall the equations correctly, then yeah. all of this is dated T, but yes. you're, you're saying you're using the word predictive here. So, so, I mean, is this the FOMC announcement that is issued to explain a change in the, in the Fed funds target rates? Or is this about the subsequent? No, no, the, these, are, these are simultaneous in timing. So, so here I'm just saying predict and, and uh, which, uh, I should probably say the fitted, um, or, or the, the, it's a regression that's you know estimated, um, and so um, yeah, predict so it, uh, it, no, it's, it's simultaneous. There's no forecasting at this right. point. So effectively, you're you're testing whether they actually explain well what they just did, right? I mean, they exactly. announced today we we raised the rate, and do they actually explain that? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, 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 Amy, while you've paused, there, there are a few questions that have come in on quad grams. Um, okay. so, so let me read them out to you. They, they come from various people. Uh, so one is, uh, in the quad grams, do you identify nouns and verbs separately? Did you try other n grams too? And if so, what are the top ones look like? Uh, it's a bit, you know, it's a bit hard to see an objective reason to use four rather than, I guess, three or two. Yeah. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, why not an exagram like, believe me, it will be enough? So I think these are all similar questions. So I'll let you answer Yeah, them. so, so, the, uh, so, so, so I, in the paper, we have robustness where we look at, you know, varying the number of n-grams and um, the vast majority of the results are gonna go through whether we use trigrams or pentagrams going up to sequences of five words. Um, but uh, what we found is that going down into uh, unigrams or bigrams that there is just so um, little context for for either of those that we didn't really have a sense of being able to validate them. It would be things like, um, you know, things could show up like level help, and we'd be like I don't know what, what that necessarily means. So part of the reason for going with slightly higher number of sequences of words, um, one is the context that you know we can validate that some things make sense and we can get a sense of what uh, a, a unit of observation uh, is, is representing. The second um, has to do with uh, frequency of use. So thinking, you know, there's enough bigrams that you know we could always overfit or fit perfectly everything. Um, no matter what, just because of, you know, the smaller sample size that we're dealing with. Um, 
but the, there, there's robustness that I would say 90% of the results and the results I'm going to show you today are going to go through whether we look at, um, you know, they're, they're robust to the different specifications that we look at with either trigrams, looking at trigrams and quadgrams, looking at trigrams, quadgrams and pentagrams, the list of words, uh, at least heuristically that, you know, they're looking very similar in terms of what's coming up uh, in each of the columns. And I guess it's worth also saying that given that you do some multi-word tokenization and also you drop stop words, these are quadgrams of tokens. So, so actually, it's they're often much longer expressions even than 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 four. It's just yeah. you dropped a bunch of the nuisance words. <laughs> it, 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 drop some nuisance words, and we merge some entities. So, for example, uh, long run, we said you know that's always you know showing up together. So we merge them into being you know one word. Uh, monetary policy, similarly. Um, the the first question about do we separately look at nouns versus verbs versus adjectives? Uh, no, we, we we don't look at those. We keep them all all in. There is a little bit of uh, there there is a uh, lemmatization happening here. So the reason why some of this looks um, kind of like not proper uh, grammar is because uh, the, the, there's some reversions of some words back to their base roots. Um, okay, so keeping an eye on the clock. Uh, we're going to keep moving through these results. Um, the other thing that I want to show is, you know, the communication rules that we fit for um, real side forecasts. So this is, you know, thinking about the time index uh, to just, you know, clarify after after Michael's question um, is these are the forecasts at meeting T or for the green book associated with meeting T about what next quarter real GDP growth will be and what next quarter unemployment will be. And then we use the statement that's released at meeting T as well, so a little bit after, uh, to see how the, the FOMC is discussing those forecasts. And based on the variation in words in uh, the statements, we're able to match really closely these next quarter forecasts of uh, real side variables. What's, what's really interesting, so I've shown you three graphs of things that fit really closely. Um, so what, what's really surprising is when we get to inflation, it's just not able to match the uh, green book forecast for short run inflation expectations. Uh, what's from the green books and teal books is in the black line is this, you know, uh, you know, centered at, at 2%, but it moves up and down depending on the on the time period. Uh, the red dash line is what we predict, um, or the best we can do for fitting uh, from the FOMC announcement text um, from these quadrams. And it, it's basically a flat line. It's just picking up the, the mean with with a little bit of variation. Um, and, and for us, the conclusion here is that the, the language in the, these statements uh, is not varying substantially with the short run uh, inflation forecast for the Fed. We actually also investigated further to think, well, maybe the Fed, uh, uh, after uh, John's presentation actually uh, on, the, on the seminar series recently, thinking about, well, what about long, longer run inflation expectations? And so we looked at the Green Book forecast for six quarter ahead inflation. And it actually looks that the line that we fit to the one quarter forecast of inflation actually seems to move a little bit more closely with the uh, more longer term uh, forecast for, from the Fed. So uh, we need to look into this more, but we're thinking that uh, the Fed really isn't communicating about a short run expectations about inflation, but more so uh, just those longer term uh, inflation expectations. And that's uh, the first result uh, for our paper, uh, or one of the first results that we think is really interesting. So, so far in the, in, in the section three with the fixed communi communication rules, we had this really strong assumption that language, the way the Fed chooses its words based on uh, its expectations of the future are fixed over time. Uh, that's a really strong assumption. And so when we want to start thinking about communication varying over time, uh, what we're going to do is ask a question of thinking, or the way we're going to approach this is thinking about uh, you know, for now, for the slides, we're going to focus just on predictions of the target federal funds rate itself. Uh, but thinking about uh, what is the target federal funds rate implied by the communication rule trained on past data? So this is, you know, how are they, what words are they using to justify the current target federal funds rate uh, that, that, that they're announcing uh, based on past ways that the Fed has communicated about its policy decisions. What we're going to do is we're going to compare different communication rules to fit different sample periods. And if we see, so here we're going to start doing forecasting out of sample. Uh, when we see differences in forecasts, here we're going to conclude that you know, there's some time variation in the communication rules. Um, and for the section, there are four communication rules that we're going to estimate. 
The first is going to be, uh, they're all going to be around the Great Recession and the ZLD period. Uh, the first one we're going to call the pre-recession rule that's estimated on data from 99 through August 2007. There's a pre-ZLB rule going up to September 2008, uh, an at-ZLB rule, so where we go through the December 2008 uh, announcement when the federal fund rate goes to the zero lower bound, and the announcement says that uh, they're going to have exceptionally low levels of the federal fund rate for some time. Another rule that we're going to look at is an explicit forward guidance rule where we estimate on data through August 2011. Uh, and at this statement is when uh, the Fed announced that uh, we were going to be at the ZOB for at least through mid 2006 or 2013. Uh, on the next graph here uh, is going to be what those different things predict. So the solid black line is the target federal funds rate uh, level. And these different colored lines are going to be the different rules that we estimate. Uh, there are vertical lines indicating when uh, the, you know, what is in sample versus out of sample for each of the different rules. There's two things that I really want you to take away from this graph. The first is looking at the, this top line versus the second line, um, which is the, uh, the pre-recession versus pre-ZLB rule. Here, uh, there's a, a level shift, but really the pattern for how the forecast changes uh, from statement to statement is very similar. So here, what we interpret uh, is that between August 2007 and August 2008, there isn't a large difference in the communication rule because uh, these patterns of forecasting in the future are very similar. The second takeaway uh, is that, or there's going to be three takeaways. The second takeaway is that looking to the September 2008 uh, rule or the at ZLB rule, they're the forecasted uh, target federal funds rate, the predicted uh, target federal funds rate for that rule uh, does have follow different patterns compared to the others. So, so here we're thinking that there is a shift in the communication rule or how um, the central bank is communicating its forecast to the public. The third takeaway is that for all of the rules, they're indicating much higher target federal funds rates uh, in you know going to the zero lower bound period even if we go through the August 2011 uh, rule, there's still this indication that we're predicting a liftoff that's, that's much sooner than what we see in the data. And after digging into this result, uh, we find that this is something that is driven by the uh, uh, use of language about recovery and improvements to the economy, strengthening the economy, uh, and those are the coefficients that are driving the increases here. The, this result is something that is robust, again, to no matter which way we slice the data, having even, this one even survives with looking at, uh, you know, bigrams or, or unigrams or trigrams, quadgrams, pentagrams. Um, so, so this is something that we think is really interesting that we can systematically pick up on what uh, anecdotally people were, were, were talking about, that the Fed seems to be signaling liftoff um, before the actual liftoff period. Okay. So uh, just going through, this is going to be our last section and our last set of results. We're going to start talking about, well, you know, so far we've only focused really on how the, the first communication, well, what, what is the, um, how are words co-varying with the, the Fed's forecasts? Uh, but now we're going to start looking at bringing it to the perceived communication rule for how markets are trying to understand uh, the text from the, the Fed. So this graph is showing uh, the forecasts from the SEP and from Fed Fund futures prices of what the FOMC versus market think the target federal funds rate will be at the end of a given year. So uh, here we see spikes at the beginning of the year in 2015, where the FOMC thinks that uh, liftoff is going to happen sooner and rates are going to increase faster. And then as we get closer to the end of the year, they revise down their forecast. So that's why we see this kind of jagged pattern. Um, then the market forecasts are coming from the Fed Fund futures prices um, at the end of the day of an FOMC announcement release. So this is after the market has seen the SEP and the statement and the press conference, if there is one, uh, what the market uh, is forecasting will happen uh, a year from now. So this is something that is really interesting that we're going to see some, some cool patterns and different behavior from markets versus the FOMC, even when they are releasing their forecast. Just to call back to that earlier question. Um, and what we do is we're going to estimate uh, the communication rule, which is going to be the text prediction of the blue line, so the FOMC forecast, uh, and the perceived rule, which is the text prediction of the market forecast. 
Uh, here, uh, we're able to very closely match, uh, you know, the communication rule pretty closely follows the uh, FOMC forecast and the perceived rule very closely follows the market forecast. Um, and so what's really interesting is when we start looking at what words are driving these, this pattern or this behavior. And, uh, you know, we're just going to highlight just a couple that I think uh, broad trends that I think are really important is that for the communication rule, so the, uh, you know, what's matching the Fed's expectation of a higher target federal funds rate or a lower target federal funds rate are largely focused on either the objectives of the Fed or the mandates of the Fed. Uh, and, and it includes some more uh, forward guidance style language. So thinking, you know, waiting until things improve, um, you know, talking about appropriate risk, the stance of monetary policy, uh, what are the goals or long run goals of, of the central bank. What's different is that markets are almost exclusively focusing on either uh, financial market phrases or labor market phrases. So it isn't really something about, um, it, it isn't as much about the, um, policy itself is about information about how the Fed is responding to um, these financial markets, so credit, um, uh, as well as uh, thinking about labor um, and, and, and unemployment. So uh, the last graph that I'm going to show you, um, the last kind of finding is, well, what happens if we think about the difference between this perception of communication versus the actual communication rule? And here we define that as being opacity. Um, and what we find is some really interesting patterns is that um, opacity seems to be, you know, low during periods where there is less uncertainty about the, the, the policy here. So this is, you know, during the ZLB period, um, as well as during the ZLB period during the, the pandemic, uh, these are, are, are almost zero opacity measures. So the, the expectations are fairly aligned for both uh, um, for, for markets and the Fed. Whereas once there's this uh, discussion of going into liftoff and the economy changing, there's uncertainty about both policy and the economy, um, that, that means that there's more room for interpretation from the announcement itself. You know, what does the Fed actually mean when it says uh, things are getting better when it's been saying it you know, for years and we're still at the zero lower bound? So trying to relearn what communication means leads to this increase in opacity that then starts decreasing uh, you know, miscommunication over time. So we think here that you know, in periods of high uncertainty when there's high opacity, uh, that's exactly the time when there's a role for communication to try and help resolve some of that uncertainty um, over, over many meetings. So uh, I went a little bit over the time um, and, and I'm still excited to like, leave time for questions. So I'm just gonna wrap up here uh, with our conclusion saying that uh, you know, here we're really talking about systematic communication rules uh, for the central bank. We talked about conceptualizing this as well as trying to estimate uh, these rules and the data. Uh, and we have some pretty, I think, interesting results about what this method implies about how the Fed has been communicating uh, and what systematic communication looks like. Uh, but going forward, we're going to be digging even more into looking at this opacity measure, where are there you know, periods of miscommunication and what, what is generating these, these wedges. Um, but with that, I just want to say thank you so much. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So, so there were a couple of questions that came in that were answered, which we can, we can uh, dip back into. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so I want to, I want to just touch on, on one, um, one, one reaction myself directly. I, I was intrigued about how, you know, you, the opacity idea, you know, what, why is it not just that the market thinks the Fed is wrong? It, you know, they may read it perfectly clearly and exactly extract the signal that was meant to be sent, but they just sit there and say, look, those guys think they're going to lift off in 12 months. I mean, they're mad. There's no way the economy can get that. And in six months, they'll realize and they'll push it out again. And I can imagine how that snowballs. You know, suddenly we're three years into that and we're like, OK, yeah, it's coming in 12 months. OK, yeah, I believe you. So, so is that an OK interpretation? Uh, I think I think yeah. At this point, uh, you know, Laura, like, correct me if I if I'm wrong. At this point, we've been we're we're fairly agnostic about what's generating that those wedges or that that opacity, um, and it, we're totally sympathetic to the the possibility that this is just um, you know markets saying you know I disagree with the Fed's forecast about when liftoff is going to happen, and and, that, and that's absolutely okay. 
um, we just find it really interesting that we can also pick up on systematic differences in word use that are associated with those forecasts. Um, and so this is something that, you know, we're hoping eventually to take further to, to have more breakdown of, you know, what is generating this opacity? Are there periods where, you know, the Fed fund futures, um, you know, thinking that there are, sorry, the, thinking that there are periods where markets just disagree with the Fed's forecast, or what about periods where the Fed isn't releasing the SAP? Because that only happens every other meeting. It doesn't, you know, before 2012, it wasn't happening either. So thinking about what happens during periods when there is this forecast released versus when it isn't. So there's kind of these two dimensions about, you know, whether markets agree or disagree with the Fed's forecasts, um, and then whether or not there are forecasts that they can actually look at versus just infer from the text. So, so, so those are two kind of dimensions that we're, we're, we're still working on, uh, but even just this having time variation and how much the Fed, dis, how much these forecasts disagree and being able to look at what text is associated with those disagreements uh, is something that we're really excited about. Okay, there, there was a discussion which took place, which Laura, Laura was handling in the comments, but I, but I think it warrants, uh, uh, there, there was one which I handled on your behalf, which was just to explain the background to how statements come about. Um, you should feel free to look at it when Laura is presenting and correct uh, anything which you think I said was wrong, but I, I'm pretty certain that's how it is. I, I, I look at the same stuff. Um, but the, the discussion which I thought was super interesting is this idea of optimal communication. Um, so this was, you know, how should optimal communication rule vary with forecasts and fundamentals? And of course, you're doing sort of reduced form stuff. So, you know, that, that that's not what you're trying to do. But then um, Felix uh, asked, you know, could you optim operationalize optimality of communication based on the findings and the available data? So one thing, so, so that is on Laura and my to-do list is to look into that. Partly what that requires is, you know, introducing more structure into the language modeling decisions uh, in terms of, you know, actually, you know, having, having a merger between, you know, the actual data that we see about communication versus, um, you know, structural modeling. Um, so that's something that's definitely on the, on the to-do list. Uh, and we're interested, and we think that there, you know, we have an idea on how to do that. So maybe we'll come back for a future seminar with, a, with that follow-up paper. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, uh, uh, Tatovic actually uh, uh, mentioned also a, uh, a, a reference uh, and I'm going to engage in, in some horribly uh, indulgent self-citation here. Um, I actually have a paper with uh, Max Ahrens, which was my first ever publication in a machine learning journal, where, where we actually did something a little bit similar, but we were mapping green book forecasts from green book texts. But then we used that, that algorithm to extract signals on forecast variables from speeches. Um, and so we used it in this one particular exercise for this machine learning journal, but we are, we are doing some work at the moment looking at, at, at sort of how those signals move markets in a more economics uh, uh, context rather than just the exercise. Um, let me just quickly, there's one, um, uh, there's one last comment, which I'll bring in, and then uh, uh, Laura, I will hand over to you. Um, and it looks like the study tries to estimate communication rules by using words to explain forecasts and policy outcomes. If communication is such an important signal to market participants, is it possible that macro variables and FFR can be used to explain what text is written instead? I guess this is uh, Eddie's idea is to sort of re reverse the, uh, the, 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 the thinking. Yeah, so for the approach that we're using, at least in this paper, um, have so at least my understanding of the question is, is it possible to have a generative model, to have like a, a text generating um, uh, setup? So that's something that, you know, again, we're looking into and thinking about optimal communication and what an optimal communication rule is going to look like, but also that's going to require a slightly different approach to text analysis from just doing these uh, regularized regressions. Um, so I think it's possible. I, you know, there's going to be constraints in the sense that uh, monetary policy, or I should say text generation is, you know, only so good. So I, I think there's probably the potential for some interesting results, or at least some funny um, automated, automatically generated statements based on Fed forecasts or something like that. Um, but, uh, you know, these are things that I've thought of, you know, we, we, Laura and I've talked about and I've thought about um, with this method, no, that's not possible. With other methods, it's possible, but with, you know, you know, uncertain uh, degrees of, you know, potential success. 
Excellent. Okay, Amy, uh, thank you very much. Uh, even I feel a bit awkward. I'm going to clap anyway, because even I'm clapping Laura and she's about to present her own stuff. But, you know, I thought that was great. It's always good to see. And like I say, uh, super exciting stuff. So uh, we all look forward to seeing it, it, it develop. Uh, Laura, the, the, the floor is yours now. Now, now, there's a lot of pressure on you to reciprocate and have a different joint paper with Amy that you're going to talk about. But if, if you don't, you know, that's that's just unfair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the, the other joint paper is uh, is in the works. Good. Um, Perfect. Floor is yours. So thanks so much for um, for having me um, uh, in a kind of a double package uh, this time around. So I'm super excited to be here. So thanks for the invite. And so let me again say that uh, the usual disclaimer applies. So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna be talking about talking over time, a dynamic central bank communication policy. Okay, so I'm going to entertain the idea that if we try to think about a central bank talking over time that is talking in a dynamic fashion, and that's going to introduce a new dilemma to how to communicate in an optimal fashion. So when central banks talk uh, to the market, so they try to, to provide information, um, then it turns out that you know, they end up talking to financial markets because there's a large literature that shows that households, at least in normal times, tend to be inattentive to central bank communication. At the same time, financial markets pay close attention to central bank communication. There's also large literature documenting that. So when central banks provide markets with information, they actually end up talking to financial markets. But this leads to a dilemma in a dynamic world because the mandate of the central bank is focused on things that are at short horizons, namely stabilizing the business cycle in the, in the, in the short run. So but the recipients of the communication at the same time care about future returns. And the central bank's mandate is about current inflation and employment. Um, and so you get this sort of dynamic uh, trade-off here that you're talking to somebody that, that cares about the future, but at the same time, your mandate is about uh, current stuff. Okay, and so this paper is really how about how to optimally deal with this trade-off. So in particular, how should the central bank balance talking about today versus tomorrow? And how clearly should the central bank talk, okay, in this dynamic environment, okay? And so what I'm gonna do in the paper is to study the same communication problem in a static and a dynamic setting to tease out how this novel trade-off plays out and how to optimally resolve it and to see how different uh, an optimal dynamic communication role is as compared to uh, the one that you would get in the static version of the problem. And I'm gonna look at it in a dynamic Bayesian persuasion game. Okay, so in this, in this framework, the central bank's gonna send a signal to the financial market. The signal is going to mix information about the present and the future. And I'm gonna look at the optimal weighting between the present and the future in the signal. And this is a dimension that I'm gonna call targetedness of, of the signal. And I'm also gonna look at the optimal clarity of communication. To the precision dimension of communication. Okay, and what I'll find is that in a dynamic world, uh, prior beliefs are going to be crucial. In particular, what the central bank will want to do is it will want to influence the direction of the prior main belief. So that's going to lead the central bank to want to talk to talk more about the present than the future in its signal compared to uh, the static analog. Okay, and it will also want to look at the tightness of the, the prior variance of the financial market. Um, so it will want to kind of loosen up uh, priors um, and that's gonna induce the central bank to talk less clearly than it would uh, in a static world. Okay, so I'm gonna skip the literature for the sake of time and go right into uh, the meat of it. Okay, so here's the setup. So we'll have uh, Laura, Laura, can I can yeah. I just can I just interrupt just for one sec, just to sure, just sure. contextualize because uh, yeah. I, I'm I'm very favorable to this because uh, I have with um, uh, Robert Goodhead, who I know is on the call, and and, and two other co-authors at the Central Bank of Ireland, or one's now at the ECB, Connor Parle, 
Um, we have some work talking about this idea of present versus future communication. But, but I, I think it's worth telling the audience that, that, that in, in our standard full information, rational expectations models, communication about the present should have no signal value at all. Right. So, so, so you're, you're, you're already starting from a point where there may be a, a private information, um, which just to forewarn you, I'm very happy with. But but some people get quite upset at that suggestion. But I, I, I'm just interjecting for context. Yeah, no, but I, I agree with that. Very much. So. So, yes. So I will have to make a make a particular assumption, namely that uh, there is some information that the central bank can actually provide the market with. Um, and I, I will spell that out um, more formally later and yes so i think of this assumption as a as a fairly natural assumption but but i can see you know why you know not all audiences may be thinking that um for for reasons that maybe financial markets are concerned with gathering information so 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 i agree that 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 can be debatable but i think there there are good arguments for why that should be the case given that it's also the central bank's job to monitor the economy as well as it can um, so, okay, so, so yes, uh, the central bank will be the sender in this communication game. So it will send a signal that will uh, give some information to the financial market who will be the receiver of the game. Um, and there will be two states uh, that I'm gonna think about as output today and output tomorrow. So really this is going to be an infinite uh, horizon uh, or infinite period game, but I'm just gonna always be focusing on today's output and tomorrow's output. Uh, for the sake of an interpretation. And here is the information assumption, I'll, I'll spell it out more clearly, but they're going to be known to the central bank and unknown to the financial market. Okay. And then the payoffs of the two players are going to be the functions of these states, uh, so of output in, in, uh, in, in the future and today, and of the uh, financial market's action. And the financial market is going to take an action that I'm going to think of as investment. And the financial market is going to, you know, take an investment decision in order to maximize uh, their payoff. And that payoff is going to be conditional on the future. Okay, and so the preservation element in this game is going to be the, the central bank signal, ST, which is essentially going to provide uh, the financial market with information. And it's going to try to induce the financial market to take an action that maximizes the central bank's payoff. So that's the, the preservation element. Okay. So let's look at the economic environment. So I'm just going to entertain this simple AR1 process for the economic fundamental, where I'm gonna think of you know, theta t as being current output and theta t plus one as future output that are going to be linked through this auto covariance uh, term rho. Yeah. Um, and then there's going to be an innovation that will be normally distributed, okay? All right. And the payoffs of the players are going to look like this. So, so the top row describes the payoffs of the financial market. So you can see that what I'm assuming is that the financial market is going to try to set investment to track the future uh, economic fundamental. So it's essentially going to, I'm thinking of this as like a, a simple way to say that, that the financial market cares about future returns. And so it's setting in, investment in period T to maximize returns in period T plus one, okay? And of course, this is going to be conditional on the financial market's expectation of the future, right? And then the central bank instead is going to set, you know, is going to, the, the, their payoff is going to be uh, contingent on the financial market's investment setting, but they will want the investment setting to track the current uh, output with this weight B that I'm just going to normalize the one here. Um, which is essentially reflecting the idea that, that the central bank wants uh, the financial market to set investment so as to achieve, so, so that the central bank can achieve its current employment and inflation uh, mandates, okay? All right. Okay, and here is the, the more formally spelled out information assumption where I'm gonna say that the central bank is going to know the fundamental process up to, so the full history up to the one period ahead uh, value. This is for simplicity. And the financial market is only going to observe the sequence of signals that the central bank sends up to time t. Okay. 
all right, and then I'm going to take a simplifying assumption about the form of the signal, which is going to be very convenient because it's going to uh, it's going to neatly separate uh, the two um, the two dimensions of communication that I'm going to study. Um, so I'm going to assume that the signal is going to look like this. It's going to consist of uh, theta t, so it's going to consist of today's output. It's going to also consist of tomorrow's output, and with some weight term c and some noise term vt, which is going to have this uh, volatility um, term. Okay, and so let's let these are the two dimensions of communication that we're going to focus on. So this c is essentially going to stand in for how much the central bank weights the future versus the present uh, in its signal. So this is what I call targetedness in this paper. Um, and clearly, if C is less than one, then the signal targets tomorrow's state. And if C is greater than one, then the signal targets current output. And if C is one, then the signal is not targeted at all. Okay. And the other dimension is just going to be the precision dimension, which is going to be just a question of how high the sigma here is, which just says how much noise there is in the signal. So how clearly or how unclearly the central bank talks. So clearly if a sigma goes to infinity, then the signal is imperfectly, so is, is perfectly imprecise. And if sigma is equal to zero, well, then the signal is perfectly precise. Okay, and, and so it, now that we've set up the structures, I'm not gonna show you the static analog, but essentially what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have uh, a static version of the same problem in which, of course, I have to sort of, you know, I sort of have to push the vocabulary a little bit because in the static version, there aren't really, you know, a current and the future uh, output. So instead, I'm going to say that, you know, suppose that there was the same trade off present in a static world as in the dynamic world. Let's compare the optimal communication policies across those two models. And just for the sake of, of, of language, I'm going to refer to you know, the current state and the future state also in, in the case of the static model. So that's a little bit of a stretch of language there. Okay. So now I can look at, you know, the equilibrium of this game. So this perfect Bayesian equilibrium, which is essentially just, it's very ugly, but it's essentially just saying that everybody's doing the optimal thing. So the, the financial market is just setting investment so as to maximize payoffs subject to their beliefs that are formed uh, optimally, which is what the, the last bullet point said. And then the central bank is going to choose the targetedness and the precision dimension in order to maximize their own payoffs subject to the beliefs of the financial market that they induce and subject to this particular form uh, of the signal. Okay, so now let's get to, to the result. Um, so here is the optimal targetedness. So what this is showing is C in the two model. Uh, so the blue line is the static model and the red line is the dynamic model. Uh, and I'm showing here C as a function of rho. So as, as a function of the autocorrelation between today, so today's output and tomorrow's output. Okay. And so there are essentially two takeaways. One is that qualitatively, the two models behave similar, similarly. Right. So in particular, you know, the endpoints um, are the same and they, they have the same shape. But quantitatively, what we see is that the red line is always above the blue line, which means that C is always higher in, in the dynamic model than in the static model. And I'm going to interpret that in a second. Basically, what that says is that in the dynamic model, the central bank always weights the current output stronger in its signal. OK, but before I, I interpret that, um, let's try to understand why this is what uh, the optimal communication uh, or optimal targetedness looks like in the first place. So let's look at the endpoints first. So when rho goes to one, then essentially today's and tomorrow's output are almost the same up to, up to the innovation. So in that case, this sort of resolves the tension or the trade-off between, uh, between the financial market and the central bank. And so in that case, the central bank is happy to give away information about the future. And so therefore, it, it essentially starts to target only the future um, in its signal. On the contrary, 
when rho goes to minus one, then there is a, a strong conflict of interest because the, you know, the future and, and the present are really going in opposite directions. And so in that case, the central bank prefers to, to essentially set C to one. So essentially really have a confounding signal. So not target either of the states because it understands that, you know, even if it, even if it reveals a lot of information about, uh, you know, current output, then the financial market is just going to use that information to infer stuff about future output. And that would be very painful because the two go in opposite direction. So th that's, why, that's why we have these two particular endpoints. And in the in-between, the, those are the situations where um, you know, the two states are both sufficiently distinct um, as well as not you know, going too much in the opposite direction that the central bank actually has an opportunity to, you know, to talk about current stuff and actually push uh, the financial markets beliefs in the right direction and therefore push uh, investment in the right direction. Okay. But so, uh, as I mentioned, the, um, in the dynamic model, uh, the red line is always above the blue line. In other words, uh, the central bank always prefers to, to talk more about current stuff um, than future stuff and than it, than it would in the static world. So why is that? So let's try to, to understand that. So what I want to uh, focus on is, is you know, what are, drive, what are the things that are driving the financial markets beliefs on today's output, which is what the central bank wants to, wants to push um, um, in a particular time period T. So of course it's, you know, today's signal. So in today's signal, there's information about current output, but that's not the only signal that includes information about current output. Because actually, you know, yesterday's signal was, you know, talking about something that was the future yesterday, which is actually today turns out to be, you know, today's output. And so that means that already yesterday's signal was giving away information, which is incorporated into the financial markets beliefs um, at time T. So that's going to show up as a prior that's pushing in a particular direction. And so if you weight future stuff too much in the dynamic world, then you're gonna end up with inheriting priors that are going in the wrong direction. And that's why you want to, you want to really, you want to decrease the weight that you put uh, on, uh, on, on future output because you understand as a central bank that you know, next period that's gonna come back uh, and get you. It, it's, going to, it's going to still be in the financial markets um, expectation. So that's, that's the sense in which the, the prior mean is going to be uh, pushed in the in the wrong direction, and so the central bank understands this uh, over time, and therefore, uh, therefore reduces the weight that it it puts on on future stuff. Okay, all right. I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and moving on to the optimal precision. Um, so here is a, Laura. Uh, it, yeah. is, that, is now a good time to just there's there's two questions that have come in, um, and and. Mm -hmm. One of them relates to something I was going to ask later, so I, I, yeah. now might be a good time for them. So, so the one I, that I was thinking of was, so, so the first one is um, from Paolo, uh, I may have missed something. If financial markets want to set investment as a function of future theta and investment uh, affects current theta, why doesn't the central bank care only about future theta? Um, so that's one of them. While you're thinking about that, I'll, I'll, I'll state Christoph's one just publicly so people know what we're talking about. Um, how important is it that the, uh, the financial market does not observe past realizations of the fundamental theta? And this is what I was thinking, right? They never learn the truth. So, I mean, I guess at some point, you're, you know, you're always relying on signals of, of, of very long ago stuff, but, but they become less important as time goes on, it'd be my guess. But I'll leave you with those and you can defer them to the end if you wish. Yeah, no, okay. So, so for Paulo's question about... Um, um, why, why the central bank doesn't care about future theta. So, so this is something that I, you know, is an assumption here in the model is it's not, uh, it, th that is not a result. Uh, so the model is really set up to, to mimic the way that, that I think uh, the institutional framework works uh, to, um, you know, for central banking. So in particular, the fact that the mandate of the central bank is either about, you know, current price stability or it's about you know, price stability and employment. Um, that essentially means that you can think of the central bank as 
you know, smoothing the business cycle in the in 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 the in the in the short run. So it's so by the mandate, it's kind of well um, mandated to um, to care about about um, about current stuff. And so that's really that's really what I'm capturing with the assumption that the payoffs are the way that they are. So it, so that's not that's not a result. It's really an assumption that is that is designed to capture that feature. Uh, of the institutional framework. Um, and then as for the other question, how important it is that the financial market does not observe past realizations of the fundamental. Um, so of course it is important. So if, you know, if the fundamental was revealed, then, you know, that would perfectly pin down prior beliefs. Um, so here in particular, because, because the signal is, is you know, specified the way that it is, so I can actually point it out here on the slide, because the signal mixes just two periods, if, if the fundamental were revealed you know, further in the past, so with a lag, like say, you know, theta t minus two was revealed, then there would still be a role for the signal, right? Because it would still be contributing information that wasn't around. Um, but of course, uh, you know, if, if, every, if the full past was revealed, then there would be no, no role for uh, for the past signals to influence prior beliefs. So that's that's absolutely that's absolutely accurate. Okay. Any other questions at this point? No, no. Sorry, carry on. Okay. Sorry, could I could I? Oh, mm -hmm. back here. Um, yeah. Maybe just as an interpretation, you know, would it be possible to just think of this as the central bank cares about the next period and investment is only going to be effective two periods from now. So, you, you know, then you, you could actually learn about today's state and it will still be, you know, shifting everything one period sort of into the future, right? So we can, we can learn about today's state, but, you know, I have investment lags and that's only going to lead me to, to some output two years from now. And the central bank has transmission lags, so it's, it's, it's going to care about next year. And then your story would still go through and it, it's a little bit more plausible to to think that actually the state gets revealed at some point yeah so i think that's a great point uh and, and that you know that would make it you know make the mapping of the model to kind of a realistic framework of of, of i think of, of central bank communication um uh smoother um I, I really see my framework as um as an approximation a very crude and simplifying approximation of what you said so that's a that's a very good point. Okay. All right. So now I'll, I'll get to the optimal uh, precision. So here, what I'm showing is the optimal uh, precision. That is the optimal sigma, so the optimal noise on the signal for a, a cross section. So in particular, I'm showing sigma uh, as a function of rho for various fixed values of targetedness, so particular values. So this is, you know, one, one case where, um, where you're targeting the, um, the future. This is where a non-targeted signal, and this is um, a signal that is targeted the, um, towards the present. Um, but don't worry about it. Um, instead, simply look at, uh, simply compare the blue and the red dashed line. So the blue line is the optimal precision in the static world or in the static model, and the red dashed line is in the dynamic model. And so what clearly jumps out is that in the static model, the uh, optimal precision choice has this sort of bang bang nature in the sense that it, um, you know, initially, so I'm capping it here at, at 10, but you know, you could cap it wherever, it's basically infinity uh, up to a certain point. So as you increase the autocorrelation of the states at a certain point, optimal precision switches from being, you know, infinitely noisy to being infinitely precise. Okay, and you see this feature um, uh, as a function also of, you know, whatever the targeted dimension is. Um, um, so for the non-targeted signal, you are always perfectly precise. And then for different levels of targetedness, there is some other threshold at which you switch in the static model. But what you can see interestingly is that in the dynamic model, you don't get, you don't get this fully bang bang thing. You do get interior solutions. So for example, here you see that for some row uh, that is 
below some threshold, you have infinite noise. And then you get a bunch of interior solutions. And then uh, at the end point of rho equal to one, um, you get infinite precision. OK? And so now the, the, the last part that I want to do here is to understand why that is happening. Why do we get these interior solutions in the dynamic model? OK? And for that, I'm going to propose to look at the, the uh, tightness of the prior variance of the financial market. So just consider the prior variance and the posterior variance of the financial market and take the difference to construct something that I'll think of as the reduction in uncertainty. So this is sort of related to this notion of mutual information in, this, um, in the global games literature. Um, so this is essentially saying, you know, take the prior variance subtract the posterior variance. And what you get is the amount of uncertain, the amount by which uncertainty has been reduced thanks to the signal ST. So I'm gonna think of this as the informativeness of the signal ST at time T about the particular fundamental. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plot this for various values of rho and C. So for various uh, autocorrelation and for various um, targetedness. So there are a lot of graphs here. So let's just focus on this, this uh, bottom right one. Um, so in red, you see the informativeness of the signal at time t about future output as a function of, of noise, okay? And in blue, you see uh, the informativeness of signal st about current output as a function of noise, okay? And this, uh, this vertical gray line is showing you the optimal um, precision choice, okay? And so what you can see is that the red line is always monotonically decreasing. So meaning that, you know, the more noisy the communication, the less informative signal ST is about future output. But instead, the blue line is oftentimes non-monotonic, meaning that if you start at very low levels of noise and you increase noise, the signal actually becomes more informative about current output, okay? And this is really coming from the fact that, that the signal is, so the current signal is really not the first to provide information about current output because yesterday's signal already did, right? And so, if, so the point here is similar to the targetedness point. The point is that if, yesterday's signal was very precise, then you already gave away a lot of information about current output. And so therefore, you're having a hard time today to actually contribute information. And so this essentially, I showed in the paper, this essentially leads to this motive for um, smoothing the, the provision of information. So the central bank essentially wants to decrease the precision of its signal in order to loosen up the prior belief of the financial market and essentially, you know, just gradually provide information um, about current output. Okay, so those are really um, the, the two main results that I have here. So let me wrap up. Um, what I've done is uh, studying an optimal dynamic communication policy that I'm comparing to a static analog to understand how different the, um, the optimal dynamic rule is. Okay, and so the takeaway is that Relative to static communication, the dynamic policy is more targeted toward the present, i.e. You, you prefer to speak more about the, the fundamental that you care about compared to, um, compared to what, the, what the receiver of the communication cares about. And it's also going to be less precise than the static communication. And the reason that it, it has these two features is because the central bank really needs to correct both the direction and the tightness of the financial markets prior. Okay, and a conclusion for that for actual central bank communication policy is that what you get wrong when you ignore the dynamic dimension of communication is you look like you were a discretionary uh, communicator because you essentially ignore the effect of your current communication on future beliefs via the endogenous priors. Okay, thanks so much. Great, excellent on time as well. And uh, we have a couple of minutes left. Um, so. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open with 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 a question which I I, I fear I, I just missed you saying it but it seems like you know like given the stochastic nature of the state of the economy you know after 
is there a state contingent or a post-shock contingent differential policy you would like? By which I mean, you know, if I've signaled on the current state, and, and let's say I've I've got the financial markets with a really tight prior of or a relatively tight prior of what was theta t plus one, and I get to t plus one, but there's been a big shock. So now we've got a kind of tight prior about the wrong thing. Do I want to do even more on the current state to correct that, to sort of shift it across? I mean, it's a little bit an implication of your result, which I'm interpreting as because my communication about the future has this second implication next period, I probably don't want to do too much because then when I get there, it could be a problem for me. Um, and, and, and so, but, but would I ever want to sort of do even more if, depending on the, the realization of a shock? I guess that would be in a kind of discretionary world where you could adjust this each period. Yeah. So, so what I, yeah, so I wasn't clear on this. So I am looking at sort of a, a kind of commitment type yeah, yeah, problem. Yeah, I got that. Yeah. Um, um, and so, so, you know, by default, you know, within this this class of problems, you wouldn't you wouldn't ever do that. Um, okay. um, but but I do think that uh, you know, in practice, that can still arise as a concern. Um, and I think that the prediction of this model uh, regarding that is, you know, if you have a very large shock that that would call for action, you would still you know try to you know limit yourself because you essentially do understand that. That there's a, I like to think of this mechanism as essentially cutting myself in the leg, uh, kind of, uh, kind of dynamics in the sense that you know I do something today, so I talk about about you know uh, output tomorrow today, because I think I can push things in the right direction today. But next period it comes back and gets me. Okay, and so even if I get a very large shock, I'd say I think that what what the model teaches us is that. You might want to try to, you know, in a discretionary fashion, you know, do a little additional correction, but you wouldn't want to go overboard because you would understand that that, uh, that this is going to uh, result in, you know, my life being harder tomorrow. Okay. Um, do we have any other questions? Let's see if... Uh, there's a lot. I'm just catching up. <laughs> so, so, so Paolo asking, uh, su suggesting it's like when flight delays are announced, the shock that companies start with thirty minutes and end with three hours. Um, um, uh, so let, let me let me put it this way. So I, I think that then you know what one way that is similar is that I do think that they do you know the smoothing of information provision. Uh, <laughs> I think we've all experienced that when we're sitting at the airport and we would like to get information about you know, future output, meaning, you know, when do I get to actually get into the plane? Um, but they are smoothing, definitely. Uh, and they're not providing um, that information too early. Okay, I've got one more, um, which is, you know, in, in, in this environment, and I know it's true in a lot of information settings that it's optimal to send one signal, but if you could send two signals, would the central bank want to? Would they want to send a separate signal on, on on uh, theta t and theta t plus one. So, so I do have sort of um, an extension in the paper that studies a framework in which the central bank sends two signals: one on, you know, on, on current output and one on future output. The problem is that you know the mapping is not very clean. The mapping to this setting is not very clean because even though you can play around with the two precision, so then you have very standard, you know, Gaussian signal. Um, and you can, you can play around with the precision parameter on those to try to, try to get a mapping to, to this targetedness notion. But, um, but that mapping is a very messy one. And in fact, um, in fact, it, it lead, it, it really, it, it, I think it, it really, you would have to do a lot of algebraic gymnastics to get the, get the intuition through so clearly. Um, and as for whether you would want to 
whether you would want to do it uh, from the central bank's perspective. So that question I have not looked into. Um, so I, I, I'm not, not sure I can, I can say anything, anything about that. Okay, well, th that's okay, because we have literally crossed my usual threshold of quarter past, but uh, squeezing two exciting papers into one slot was always going to be tight. Um, so, so let me just uh, end this now by, uh, no, I'm going to give you your, your, your round of applause on your own, uh, Laura, and then, um, you know, just thank both of you again for presenting. As I said, you know, the, this is a a relatively new area and the real excitement for me remains that uh, increasingly uh, we have young exciting scholars like yourselves who are out there you know doing this exciting work and, and and sort of helping bridge this gap between theory empirics you know policy practice and so yeah uh, let me say uh, we will be back but not in august because of the the summer break uh, and yeah, but I hope everybody has a wonderful summer wherever they spend it. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, I hope your winter is not too bad. And I uh, hope to see you all again uh, in September. And again, thank you to uh, Amy and Laura for their wonderful presentations today. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much.